Okay, good morning everybody. I'm John Morton. I'm the agency lead for Comradis, uh, and today I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, life in Medcom's working in rare diseases. Uh, it's a little bit different to the other areas of medicine that a lot of companies work in, and why you might want to consider rare diseases as an area you'd like to look at more closely. So before I go any further, I'd like to just introduce you to Luong. Uh, Luong is uh, an eight-year-old boy living in Vietnam, and like a lot of eight-year-olds, he uh, has an infectious enthusiasm for life. However, unlike a lot of children, Luong was diagnosed with severe haemophilia type A when he was just uh, after his first birthday. And if he gives in to the natural temptation of all eight-year-old boys to run around and play with his friends, he risks developing severe bleeds in his knees and his shoulders, which aren't uh, just very painful, but they can also be life-threatening. So Luong carries a heavy burden. He has to continually reassure his mother that the regular infusions and injections that he has to receive aren't that painful after all. And because they live in Vietnam, his parents have to pay an awful lot of their salaries towards paying for his treatment. So he often tries to hide his pain and his symptoms from his patients so that they don't have to pay even more towards his treatment. So I think you'd agree that really eight-year-olds shouldn't have to deal with this, but unfortunately there are many families and many patients around the world who are affected by conditions who don't have the support they need because of the rarity of their conditions. And they need somebody to speak up for them, and that's why I've spent my entire career thus far uh, working in the rare disease field to try and give a voice to people like Luong. So I'll start off with a very basic question is what is a rare disease? It seems a stupid question because surely the clue's in the name. But a lot of people think automatically of rare tropical conditions as, as the work we do but actually it's a lot closer to home. It's, it's conditions like cystic fibrosis, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy that a lot of us have heard of. We don't necessarily realise a rare um, conditions that they come with their own sets of challenges. And until the early 80s, the, the term rare disease wasn't really widely recognised. Um, in the 60s and 70s, a lot of drug companies wouldn't go anywhere near a condition if it didn't have enough patients to make the treatment that they developed commercially viable. And as a result, a lot of patients didn't get any treatment at all. And this changed in 1982 when a lady called Abby Myers in the US um, who describes herself as just a basic housewife living in Connecticut, had a son with Tourette's syndrome and he wasn't getting the treatment he needed. And sh rather than let this just settle and, and live with it, she kicked up a bit of a stink and she wrote to lots of publications, she got lots of families together um, and they worked together and eventually she formed the National Organization for Rare Disorders in the US. And within a year they'd lobbied the US government to sign in the Orphan Drug Act. And that revolutionized the world of rare diseases, especially in the US to start off with, but later on around the world. And this led to legislation uh, starting off in Singapore in 1991 and gradually spreading um, across the globe. We eventually caught up in Europe. It's a bit embarrassing. It took us so long, to be honest. But nowadays there are specific incentives in place to make it more attractive for drug companies to develop treatments for, for orphan conditions or rare conditions so that they can make um, a commercial argument to their shareholders. And as you can see in the US it's been hugely successful. Before this act came along there were fewer than 30 treatments available for patients with rare conditions. So it's now well beyond 500 and now we're probably looking near 600. From a business point of view drug companies find this area very attractive. It's the fastest growing area of the pharma industry. It's projected to grow at a rate of 11% per year through to 2020 compared with just 4% for the other areas of medicine. There are thought to be around 7,000 rare diseases and it's estimated that there's five new diseases described every week. But for the vast majority of these there isn't any kind of disease specific treatments. And for more than 50% of these conditions, there isn't even a patient organisation to represent those families that are affected, and there's no foundation to try and raise money to try and stimulate research. And to give you an idea of the scale of the number of people that are affected, um, in total, if you put all of the pe people in the world with a rare disease 
In one country, it would be the third most populated country in the world. So despite the huge advances in legislation and the huge interest from the drug industry, there are still a common set of challenges that rare diseases um, pose when you're trying to develop a drug for it, much more so than other areas of medicine. A lot of these conditions are genetic conditions. They're very complicated in the way they manifest. And because they're so rare, there's often not an awful lot of data about them. We don't really understand them very well. And this makes it very difficult to diagnose patients for, from a start. And if you can't diagnose patients, you can't run a clinical trial. There's also very small pockets of expertise around the world. These clinical experts may be in their tens uh, or even you know, in single digits around the world. They might be very close together. They might all work at one center or they might be you know, spread all over the place. And that means that unless you're a patient living near their particular academic center or their hospital, you're unlikely to get treatment. So you're gonna fall through the cracks and you're not gonna get diagnosed and treated. As with so many things in life, unless there's a lot of you, there isn't really the political drive to help you. Uh, and as a result, even when you do get a treatment along the way, there isn't sometimes the political drive to fund this these treatments when they come to market. As I mentioned, a lot of these conditions are genetic, so they progress very slowly often. And so the, the kind of endpoints that we use to judge whether a drug's working or not, that we might use in diabetes or heart disease or something like that, the diseases progress too slowly for us to use those kinds of things. So we need to use something else, a different kind of marker to measure whether the drug, the drug works. So we use something called surrogate markers a lot of the time. And for a long time, these really weren't accepted by regulators who decided whether, whether or not a treatment got licensed. And so it made it very difficult for drug companies to show that their drug was safe and effective. And finally, as you may well have heard, orphan drugs for rare diseases are often very expensive. And the reason for this is that they cost just as much to develop as a drug for a common condition, but you've got fewer people to divide that cost up with uh, when you actually come to sell it. And so you know, the drug companies need to make the the back the money that they spent on developing it. And so governments often don't really want to pay these kind of high price tags. And so a lot of work has to go in to showing them why these drugs are so valuable. And so from a medical communications perspective, these challenges mean that we have to approach things a little bit differently and we need to help our clients in ways that we might not otherwise think about in more common conditions. So before I go any further, I thought I'd just give you a bit of a rough guide as to what, how you get into rare disease medical communications. The fact is it's no different from working in any other area of medcoms. Um, I myself, like a lot of people, fell into rare disease medcoms completely by accident. I did a, a, a science degree at university, then did a PhD, and then realised it was absolutely useless at bench science. And... Um, Fortunately, I was pretty handy at communicating my admittedly terrible data. Uh, so my PhD supervisor said, you know, why don't you think about a career in medical communications? So thankfully, uh, the industry existed and I meant I could get a job. I wasn't going to get one in bench science. Um, so I started my career in back about 10 years ago now. And the first piece of work I ever did was to mark up some scientific references for a medical education piece on Fabry disease, which I'd never heard of. And that sensation repeated itself many, many times over the subsequent 10 years. Many of the conditions that I've worked on, I've never heard of before I pick up the first scientific paper. And so I merrily went along for a few years, you know, learning the, the art of being a medical writer. Um, and my Clients and my senior colleagues kept saying to me, you know, rare diseases are different, they need a different approach. But no one actually ever explained what this different approach was and why they were different. So I thought I'd better go and have a bit of a think about this myself, and I did a lot of research to try and understand exactly what they were talking about. And on the basis of this, I've, I've discovered really that the, the services we were providing were, albeit very good, they weren't really hitting the mark in terms of what our clients needed. So. In 2012, I founded a specific division with, within my old agency so that we could just focus purely on doing rare disease work and trying to find new ways of communicating that would be more effective and, and reach the goals of our clients more effectively. And this was great. I really enjoyed it for a couple of years. And then the opportunity came along to lead my own agency. So I had the chance to build something from scratch, and that's why I, I joined Comradis. 
So I feel extremely lucky to have had the career that I had purely by accident. You know, the, I've worked on more than 25 different rare diseases over the last 10 years. Um, and the thing that really makes rare diseases stand out for me is the fact that for more than half of those, I worked on the first ever treatment for some of these conditions. So if you think about the fact that before these treatments came along, patients and their families had absolutely no hope. They were just given a life sentence that they had to gradually watch their, their loved ones fade away. And to be a, a mere medical writer and to be at the front line and actually have an effect where we can bring hope back to patients and the families and revolutionize the way that they're treated is really you know, an astounding thing to be involved in and something I don't think you really get in many other areas of medicine. And that I'm very fortunate also to have met many of the patients that I've worked you know, in the diseases that I've worked on and hear firsthand their experiences. And on a, a wet, wet and rainy you know, winter morning, it's very uh, inspiring sometimes to, to you know, come into work when sometimes it might be a little bit more difficult. So where does Comradis fit in? Well, Comradis is part of the Amiculum cluster of companies. It was created by my boss, the co-founder of Amiculum, uh, Richard Alcorn. And the idea was to, to build an agency that really helped to tackle some of the persistent challenges facing the rare disease community, but using our um, Amiculum's heritage in medical communications as a basis um, and to see what we could do to try and a diagnosis to make sure that the treatments that are being developed got to patients that needed them and made sure, made sure that the barriers that were currently up there could be circumvented. And ultimately the aim for us is, although we can't generate any data ourselves, when we don't prescribe the treatments, at the end of the day all we can do is use the information that's already out there. But our aim really is to just use that as best we can to improve standards of care for those affected by rare diseases. You might be wondering about the name as to where it came, comes from. It's not Russian or anything like that. Um, it comes from the communications and rare diseases, um, sort of play on words. The logo is based on the fact that there's one in 16 people will suffer from a rare disease at some point in their life. To be completely honest with you, it's actually one in 17, but one in 17 doesn't really work for a very nice logo, so we have to use a bit of artistic license for that. Um, coming back to the comm side of things, we believe there are three areas that we, the way that we work in, in the industry makes us a little bit different and that's our approach to communications, the fact that we have an awful lot of experience in rare diseases both from a communication side of things but also other areas that maybe we can help our clients commercialise their treatments more efficiently and we're also an active member of the rare disease community which I'll talk about in a few seconds. I put this slide up and this quote up to really remind us all that we haven't discovered everything yet. There's an awful lot of progress that can still be made in the way that we communicate, not only in rare diseases, but in other areas of medicine as well. You know, the, the likes of publication planning and advisory boards and Congress posters are fantastic vehicles for getting messages across, but we shouldn't rest on our laurels and be satisfied that that is the best way of communicating. And we continually need to re-examine them and try and evolve those, those tools to make sure that they're giving our clients the best value for money possible. This is particularly acute in the rare disease world where budgets are very tight. A lot of our clients are very small biotech companies of a handful of people who may, you know, if, if something goes wrong in a clinical trial, they haven't got anything to fall back on and that's the end of that drug. So for every pound that we waste, that's a pound that doesn't go to research or that's a pound that goes on to the price of the drug which is already very high, and it might mean that it doesn't get licensed or, or doesn't get approved by payers. So we have to be very cognizant of the fact that we need to be very responsible the way we spend our clients' money. Another reason that we have to communicate a little bit differently in the rare disease world is because it's, it's not like, um, say, if you were treating diabetes, where you've got a message and you've got to spread it as widely as possible because there's lots and lots of people you need to reach. It's not like that in rare diseases. There's very few people and they all tend to talk to each other. So you've got patients talking to physicians, talking to policy makers, talking to patient advocates and so on. And they all tend to know what they're talking about. The patients are very up to date on the science and the technology and they want to know as soon as you've got a development. And so it doesn't really work if you could just go and spray them with a load of information because you're not getting their viewpoint as well. And sometimes they know much more about the disease than we do. 
So in a way, we have to be in the middle of this conversation and to work with them to bring together their viewpoints so that they can move forward as a whole community, as a whole force. So when the people get in their way, they've got an awful lot more weight behind them. And to give you a simple analogy, it's a little bit like using a WhatsApp group rather than sending a text message to all your friends. It means you're just basically facilitating the discussion and moving it towards a united front. So being part of the Amiculum cluster of companies, we're very lucky at Comradis to be able to call on experts in clinical development, in regulatory strategy, in market analysis, in commercialization, in market access, so that we can go to our clients and we can get work with them to generate solutions to some of these common problems that they might not otherwise get. So we work with them to identify sources of data so that they can understand the natural history of a condition more thoroughly. We help them identify patients using um, electronic healthcare data. We help them identify doctors who might be misdiagnosing uh, patients so that we can educate them about the disease and make sure that patients get the treatment they need. And it even gets down to things like understanding the political environment in the countries they're trying to launch their product in so that they can make sure they circumnavigate that most effectively and speak to the people they need to. So there's all sorts of ways that we can help that we believe is going beyond the realm of medical, medcoms and being more of a consulting company um, that can really try and make a difference beyond uh, the traditional approaches. We're very, very proud of the fact that rather than simply be a company that takes a brief from a client and delivers a product on time and on budget, we get our hands dirty and we get stuck in. We're active members of the rare disease community and I think this comes across on our website. If you go and take a look at it, you'll see a, a bunch of uh, stories from patients affected by the, some of the diseases that we've worked on and you'll see a list of the various organisations that we work with on a regular basis to try and help them achieve what they want to achieve and be more effective in, in serving patients. But we also learn an awful lot from them about some of the challenges they face and how we can do our job better. So these are just a, a few recent projects that we've done, just to show a bit of the variety. We've done a, some filming of patients and interviewing patients who have been receiving bone marrow transplantation for Hurler syndrome and really understanding the, the benefits of that for them and the challenges they faced in getting a diagnosis in the first place. I went undercover and played the role of a patient advocacy lead for a very small biotech who didn't have enough people uh, to cover um, this particular event, so I put my biotech hat on and pretended to be one of them. I had conversations with patient groups at patient meetings. As I've mentioned, we've done mapping of where doctors are around the world so that, we, that our clients can reach out to them and we can help educate them. We're working with a company who's thinking about getting into rare diseases and they've asked for our advice on where the best opportunities are, where the biggest need is, so that they can make an informed commercial decision. We also support regulatory submissions. We help clients decide whether or not it's a good idea to go for orphan drug designation, which is the starting point to getting all the benefits of all the legislation which I spoke about earlier. And we also help patient organisations be more professional so that they can be more efficient in the way they work and serve patients in a better way. So obviously I'm enormously biased, this is my agency, uh, as to how wonderful we are. Uh, but I thought it would be a good idea to, to get some words up from Alicia, who started with us six weeks ago. She uh, came from uh, Oxford University, she's just finished her DPhil, uh, and so far she seems to be having a great time, which is lucky because it would be really embarrassing if she said horrible things on this slide. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. If you do think that rare diseases might be an area that you'd like to look into more and maybe work in, do get in touch with me. I'd be delighted to speak with you. But I'll leave you with a quote which I think sums up our approach to rare diseases very well. Thanks.